Now, we are now in Jeremiah chapter 6, and I want to caution you, brethren, that next Sabbath, of course, will be the Sabbath before the day of Pentecost, which I thought would be a very appropriate day to this, devote that time, that Sabbath, to uh, to make a small break from Jeremiah, from the book of Jeremiah, and to give you some other warnings about the uh, uh, the danger of drifting away from God. And I would like, lately we've been talking about the uh, more Gentiles, adding the, the number of Gentiles to the church, Romans 11. So I thought it would be a very good Sabbath to uh, spend some time with, uh, about, with the message related to the Apostle Paul, his background, because he is the author of the book of Romans, and also to this understanding that he conveyed, his understanding that he conveyed to us about the whole house of Israel and the nations. So that will be the next Sabbath uh, topic, which I think will indeed be very interesting for you. As far as the day of Pentecost, I'm, I've committed to Bob Field to uh, record a video, which I'm going to, basically in that video I'm going to preach about the um, real meaning of the day of Pentecost, uh, I'll be, of course, <laughs> relating some things about Herbert Armstrong. He used to ask us, why are we here, brethren? Well, indeed, why are we going to be here for the day of Pentecost? So that'll be recorded for you, but I might, uh, I might have, uh, another message. Well, uh, on that, on that day, in fact, I might just use again the topic of the Apostle Paul and, uh, and Israel and the nations which is again all the part of the plan that God has for the first fruits after all. So I might use that day for that, uh, because I'll break that message into two parts. So I might use that, that, that day for that. But anyway, you'll be, you'll be provided with the official, uh, CCOG YouTube channel message by me. And then we can also meet nevertheless. We can still meet online on Skype and use that wonderful day to be updated on, uh, to be updated on 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 uh, on again on the Apostle Paul and be reminded of the plan, since all nations will be grafted into Israel. Right now, we as the first fruits are already grafted into the house of Israel, and we're spirit-led Israel. So, uh, I think it will be very appropriate. But in any case, I want to give you a live message as well, rather than having you only listen to me with video. As I as I told you many times, I prefer audio messages, a radio format messages. That's what. Well, radio has been a part of my life uh, since I was a teenager. It was a very important part of my life even to this day. And uh, I feel the most comfortable with the audio messages only, without video. Video is just distracting people and distracting their minds. With audio messages, you have to listen, you have to be attentive, and uh, you have to perhaps imagine some things, which is what is the most important, use our minds. Anyway, so... Next Sabbath we'll make uh, a break from the book of Jeremiah, and then the next Sabbath, following the Sabbath, following Sabbath, we'll, be, we'll then uh, return to the book and go to chapter 7. Now chapter 6 says, O children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa, and set up a signal fire in Beth Hatzerem, for disaster appears out of the north, and great destruction. Well, brethren, siege continues in historical setting. So now Jeremiah addresses the men of Benjamin, either as being his own tribesmen, we don't know, or as a name appropriate to the people of Jerusalem, which also was situated in the tribe of Benjamin. I don't know if you know that the Holy of Holies of the um, of the and the temple, the old temple, the holy holy's bedroom belongs to Jerusalem to Benjamin. It's on the territory of Benjamin. Now the Jews have a have traditional uh, explanation for that, uh, which was when Jacob's family was going to Esau, they all bowed down to Esau, uh, but the Benjamin was not part of that group anyway. So that's the Jewish explanation why the holy of holies is in on the territory of Benjamin. Whether that's the case or not, uh, there are many things in Jewish explanations that make sense and uh, indeed they're people of the book so we can indeed take them take them with uh, unlike their tradition which we are to reject completely which they added to the law of God but you know when it comes to the explanation of certain things and historical settings yes we can certainly rely on Jewish wisdom and Jewish sages so Benjamin was the territory of Benjamin was uh, was where Jerusalem is located and the Holy of Holies is in the territory of Benjamin 
Now you might even uh, know that I think it was the 6th century when the uh, Vikings came to Jerusalem as well. Now the Vikings and Norway, Norwegians and some Danes are also descendants of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, a great part of Jerusalem, brethren, stood, again, in the tribe of Benjamin. And if you want to check about that, you go to Joshua 18.28. But I would rather advise you to jot down the verses that you can check later. So in Joshua 18.28, we see that the great part of Jerusalem was in the tribe of Benjamin. And because Jeremiah, being of Anatoth, was indeed of that tribe, and probably lived therein, the inhabitants are here addressed by the name of the children of Benjamin and are directed to leave the city which God was about to destroy and to take refuge in the mountains. It says, gather yourselves to flee. No, so gather your goods together to remove them to a place of safety. That's what the instruction is. Blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Now the name Tekoa is almost identical with the verb to blow. But it was not chosen merely for the alliteration, but because it was the last town in Judea, it's about 11 miles south of Jerusalem, upon the very border of the desert where the fugitives would halt. Now, before I return to the college, just uh, let me just tell you about this Beth, Beth Hatzerem, or it should be called the Vineyard House which was situated halfway between Jerusalem and Tekoa. Now, the place of Tekoa is very interesting. A long time ago, there was a message from, I think it was in 90, back in 1996, and I still remember part of that relatively long message given by, at that time, very uh, very aged man called Gerald Waterhouse. <laughs> he was known for <laughs> holding... Very long services. Sometimes his messages would <laughs> last for three hours. So you should be very thankful that I'm not like Gerald Waterhouse, even though I'm very tempted at times. And uh, in that message, he was mentioning this place, Tekoa. He said that it meaning its meaning is uh, pitching the tents. And he, brethren, kind of uh, connected that with our flight to the place of safety. Because it's, as I've told you, it's the last town in Judea upon the very border of the desert. And uh, Tekoa, I've checked on, on, on Wikipedia, it's actually now populated by the Jews who come from America, which means that the whole place speaks English. Uh, pitching the tents, uh, Gerald Walterhouse said that it was possible that we'll be basically kicked out of our countries before the Great Tribulation, or that on our way to the Great Tribulation, we may end up in that place, pitching the tents, you know, and having our temporary dwellings there. And then when the time comes for us to flee to the place of safety, that we might flee, if not all of us, and some of us might flee from Tekoa to the place of safety, which does make sense, in a sense, because, yes, Tekoa is not far away from Petra. So it does make sense. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to draw your attention to that fact, so I wanted to share it with you, because I remember it was a very, it was a person, it was a message, it was a, a sermon uh, that Gerald Waterhouse delivered when he was already at the end of his age. He used to be a, 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 one of the closest corporates with Herbert Armstrong. He used to travel around the world and hold services around the world and explain all kinds of things. Uh, and we should be thankful for him for that. Some of his messages remained. Some parts of his messages I've used to convey to you as well, especially about measuring the temple. And uh, that's the one that I have not, I have lost the uh, notes from that message. I don't know if that message exists anymore. At that time it was delivered in the uh, United Church of God, which was led by David Hume. However, David Hume later uh, defected from that group and formed his own group, uh, and after several years, he changed the doctrine of the seven church eras. Now, the apostate WCG leadership was among the first things that they changed, as Dr. Thiel pointed out in his uh, latest sermon on 50 errors of the Laodiceans. The first doctrine, or one of the first doctrines, was the seven church eras. So it seems to me that the same spirit uh, worked in the... Uh, with the mind of this leader uh, and uh, the same spirit that worked with the minds of the apostate leadership in Pasadena back in those days in 1995. How sad, brethren, how sad. And not only that, but also the uh, 
also the uh, the uh, uh, the doctrine of the of the of the house of Israel was changed by that same person, and uh, that's even sadder. So I thought this uh, reference to to that message of uh, Gerald Waterhouse is worthy of mention. It's worthy of mention because it does make sense in a sense, brethren. It seems that some of us, at least, will be there in Judea because the instruction, those who are in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. Well, how can that be, and Petri is mountainous area, how can that be fulfilled if uh, no one of us are in Judea? Because that instruction of Jesus Christ is given to the believers, not to the Jewish people. So, I thought I should just mention that in, that in a passing comment, that perhaps the place of Tekoa might be the place that some of us will spend some time there before the time comes for us to flee. Verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Well, this is a direct reference back into the Pentateuch, or the first five books in, of Moses, uh, or to be more precise, Deuteronomy 28, verse 56. Deuteronomy 28, 56. And then verse 3, The shepherds with their flocks, flocks shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture in his own place. Now those shepherds are hostile leaders with their armies. They are described in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 15. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. It says prepare against war against her. Rather, it should rather be rendered better and sanctify ye war against her. <laughs> there is this sanctify. Perhaps this would uh, remind you of the uh, of the uh, Islamic intifada, you know, or so-called the holy war against the infidels. And, uh, you know, they call it the holy war. There's nothing holy in that anyway. But rather than prepare war against her, the translation would be sanctify you war against her. And war in ancient times was never undertaken without religious solemnities. You have example in Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 21. So usually there was religion, even in our, in our, uh, uh, modern or more modern times, you might remember the Constantine the Great. Uh, even he would ne not go into uh, 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 war conflicts or uh, undertake any uh, a conflict with any nation before having religious solemnities. Uh, and they would look for these signs, you know, by looking the uh, inward parts of, of birds and animals and so on. It's mentioned also in the Bible as something to, to be avoided, something wrong, something not to be practiced by true Christians. But of course, all those uh, leaders were pagans, so they had the pagan religious solemnities, including Constantine the Great, who was the pagan until the end of his life, and he was the one who has done so much damage to the original Christianity. In fact, the uh, modern Christianity the nominal Christianity of today practiced all over the world is actually all the Constantine's version of Christianity. But you can read, you'll be able to read that more in my book that is coming up since he was born in Serbia. I'm writing a book about him and uh, basically focused on how he changed the Sabbath, how he uh, changed the Passover for the Easter and uh, how he pushed for Trinity. I'll just add those little details. He pushed for the Trinity and uh, he was the one who imposed... Easter observance all over the uh, Christianity and he was the one who is actually enacted a Sunday law in 321 and so forth. Anyway, so Constantine, like those ancient leaders, was having religious solemnities and uh, this is what obviously the, uh, the, uh, these, these, these neighboring nations of the Jewish state uh, obviously are having as, uh, having as their solemnities. And why would they, you know, do it at noon? <laughs> Why would they go up at noon? Well, at noon when most are resting, you know. <laughs> Verse 5, Arise, and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. For thus has the Lord of hosts said, Cut down trees, and build a mound against Jerusalem. Now this is the city to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. You see, cities are oppressed, brethren. As a, as a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. 
violence and plundering are heard in her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul departs from you. Interesting, so God has a soul, right? <laughs> no, no, of course not. My soul, soul means a whole being, lest my being depart from you. And we know that, you know, the humans, when they were created, you know, they became the living, the man himself became a living soul. So obviously, you know, God is here speaking of him as a being. Lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. You see, be instructed. Be thou chastised. Learn the lesson which chastisement is indeed to teach thee. That's what it is. The word soul that I mentioned here in Hebrew is actually nephesh, exactly the same word used for the living, living beings, uh, including the man. And man became, you know, the living soul, the living being. He became the living soul. He does not have an independent, uh, immortal living soul. No, he himself is a soul. Each person is a soul. Verse 9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean as wine the remnant of Israel. As a grape gatherer, put your hand back into the branches. Now a remnant of Israel, brethren, will be gleaned. Now put your b hand back into the branches. It's probably or perhaps addressed to Nebuchadnezzar's as God's servant. He's mentioned as God's servant in Jeremiah, tw Jeremiah 25, verse 9. Now, in which way is he God's servant? Does he practice God's law? Does he uh, obey what God commands? No, not in that sense, brethren. He's God's servant in a sense that he fulfills what God has prophesied to happen. Cyrus the Great, when he issued that decree about the return of the Jewish captives, Babylonian captives, back to the uh, back to the land, Cyrus the Great is also called in the Bible uh, a servant of God, indeed. So, uh, put your hand back into the branches. He is required to go over the wine once again, that no grapes may escape. Verse ten: To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Brethren, a perfect description of the modern house of Israel. Modern house of Israel. You see, duality in prophecy. What happened is happening again. You know, we, we, we always have this duality in prophecy. We have see that some of these things that we're reading already happened back in the history. But now they're going to happen again. So there is a perfect description of the modern house of Israel. You know, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I'll pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days. And their houses shall be turned over to others fields and wives together, for I will stretch my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Now, brethren, these are the very punishments threatened by Moses in the event of disobedience to God that are threatened in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 30. And as I have told you many times, Deuteronomy 28 and 29 and Leviticus 20, 20, chapter 26, those are the two pivotal prophecies Prophecies in the five books of Moses. Incredible how people don't realize that those first five books are not only about the law of God, they're prophecies as well. So the pivotal Old Testament prophecies, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and 29, tell us what will happen to the house of Israel if they disobey God. And when the, when the prophets were warning both houses, Ezekiel, the house of Israel, the ten tribes, and Jeremiah, in this case, the house of Judah, the prophets were always related and relying upon those Deuteronomy 28, 29, and Leviticus 26 prophecies. They always listed all those punishments that the Lord is going to let his people go through if they disobey. They always warned the people based on those based on the law of God, based on the prophecies in the law of God, they always, always relied upon them. And we read about those punishments that are going to be enacted on both houses of Israel, in the prophets, but those punishments were already, they were already outlined in God's law, brethren, in the first five books of Moses. Verse 13, 
Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Which is actually a parallel scripture in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 11. So parallel scriptures in Isaiah 56, 11. I'm, I'm on purpose, I'm not reading you all those parallel scriptures and other things, because I'm hoping that you're jotting them down, and I'm hoping that you're using your Bible as a textbook. Next to all these verses that I'm reading, you can always put on the margin line all these parallel verses and you can write some comments there. Don't don't worry about it. The Bible itself is not holy. What is written in the Bible is holy. The Bible itself is a book, a book that needs to be used as a textbook. So I'm you know, hoping that you'll be jotting down on your margins or in your notes all of these things that you can check them out later and uh, increase your understanding of the Holy Scriptures. Verse 14, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, where, when there is no peace. False prophets, brethren, no, is there a peace? Everything will be fine and great with this world. Oh, peace in the world. What do you want? Well, peace in the world. Well, there will be no peace in this world, brethren. There is no way because the human nature is satanic. But the time is coming when there will be world peace. Once the government of God is established on the earth, there will be eternal peace. There will be no end of his peace. His peace will be expanding, as it says upon his shoulders, the peace will be expanding all the time. Well, if it's true, if it's true, the space is being expanded all the time. <laughs> that exactly means that the peace that comes from God's law and God's government will be expanded all the time. Interesting, isn't it? Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Well, you see, but in peace, peace, you know, you shall have, you shall have prosperity. Isn't that prosperity gospel now prevalent in your Anglo-Saxon world? You shall have prosperity when, you know, when there was none, and when God had determined that there should be none, they still kept saying peace and peace, you know, lying to the people. Now he, here the prophets prophesied, prophesied falsely. And the people continued in sin, being deceived by the priests and by the prophets. Whereas they ought to warn the people of impending judgments and the need of repentance, they say there is nothing to fear. And then in section now from verse 16 <coughs> to verse 17, we have the answer to the question, why will God let destruction come? Because his people, brethren, would not obey God's law. They rejected it. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you shall find Rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So he wants to give them the rest. He tells them what is the the way to true peace and rest. But human nature <laughs> doesn't want to obey God. No, we will not walk in it. Now imagine from travelers who have lost their road, stopping and inquiring which is the right way on which they had once had been, but from which they have now wandered. Now the old paths, you know, well, brethren, Idolatry and apostasy are the modern way. The, the worship of God is the old way. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 15, you'll find that the worship of God is the old way. Verse 17, Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they say, We will not listen. The watchmen, of course, it refers to prophets. You know, the duty of the prophets it was to announce impending calamities so as to lead the people to repentance. You might remember when we were covering the book of Ezekiel. And when God says to Ezekiel, I appoint you as a watchman over these people, over the house of Israel. So this is exactly what it is. The duty of those prophets is to announce impending calamities and that should lead people to repentance. Verse 18. Therefore, hear you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Now, parallel to this, hear you nations, nations, and it therefore means the gathered peoples who are invited to be witnesses 
as to how great is the perversity of the Israelites and that they deserve the severe punishment about to inflict them on them. Now, Hebrew word edach, it's a ten technical pentateuchal word, word from the five books of Moses. The uh, w- uh, first occurrence we have in Exodus 12, verse 3. It is used technically of Israel, 15 times in Exodus, 12 times in Leviticus, and 83 times in Numbers. It is found in the prophets only here, and once again in Jeremiah 30, verse 20, and in Hosea chapter 7, verse 12. So, uh, I've given you now these scriptural references. Should I, rem- should I rem- uh, 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 repeat them? So, edach, a technical pentateuchal word, it's used first in Exodus 12, verse 3, technically of Israel, 15 times in Exodus, 12 in Leviticus, and 83 in Numbers, and in the prophets, is found here, in Jeremiah 30, verse 20, and in Hosea chapter 7, verse 12, this, what you have heard, is a thunder, we are having a thunderstorm here in my hometown, which is a much desired rain, for the simple reason that... Uh, there has been, in this month of May, there has been a long drought without much rain. We haven't had much rain in the last, well, two or three months. And, uh, of course, the uh, the crops are coming up, as you know. <laughs> the, the barley <laughs> harvest is coming up, and the wheat harvest and so on. So the rain is much needed. And this thunder that you've just heard, there was a severe lightning and this strong thunder. Just to remind us again of the might of God and His powerful word that is so sharp, sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting to the slightest thoughts that we might have, to those all those great secrets that we might have, and so on and so forth. So that was the thunder, and we continue. So verse 19 says, Hear, O earth, behold, I'll certainly bring calamity on these people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. <laughs> I just mentioned the uh, how the, the the word of God is so strong and mighty that it just uh, cuts greater than a two-edged sword, and it just cuts to our flight of thoughts. Well, here is the next <laughs> verse it says, about the fruits of their thoughts, brethren, because the fruits of their thoughts lead them to the actions. And their actions, of course, lead them to sin, and they're all sinful actions, and the... Uh, Wage of sin is death. So the very heathen are called upon to take notice of these threatenings and denunciations of God's wrath against the Jews, lest they should think that the calamities which were soon to fall upon that people had happened by chance and not by appointment of that God whom they had dishonored and refused to obey. And know, O congregation, it says here, well, it says, brethren, it's congregation of Israel, of Israel, namely, and the general assembly of the people at Jerusalem. So here, O earth, all heathen, he will be now another thunder, as far as I can see by the lightning, so don't be threatened. So, uh, here, O earth, the very heathen are called upon. No, yes, here is the lightning, here is the little thunder, and the rain is starting again, which is great blessing for this earth which is which is uh, thirsty for rain my law in this verse we have my law you know or it says my words meaning basically but nor my law but rejected it my law with reference to the pentateuch to the first five books of moses note that the words and the law are put alternatively so church fathers understood this to be the decree rejecting the jews from being the church well those fathers, under quotation mark, they will be terribly disappointed, plus they obviously do not understand the word of God. God says clearly in his word that he will not forsake his people. The Jews, as well as the ten tribes of Israel, brethren, are his people. He will not forsake them. And uh, as it says, all the believers will have to be grafted into the uh, mild olive of the house of Israel. We'll talk about that next Sabbath more. Verse 20 for what purpose to me comes frank incense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? 
Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet to me. Now, this uh, place Sheba, it was a part of Arabia Felix, and famous, it was famous for its spices and perfumes. You find reference to that in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And here the prophet reproves the hypocrisy of the Jews, who sought to cover their inward corruption by the external shows of religion. And we can do the same, but we can put our church face, if you wish. <laughs> we can put our church face, you know, and, and, and be one kind of people at church services when we come together, and then be completely different when we depart from one another. Now, uh, back to this playful. So, with the prophets, they often declare, you know, this, this show of religion, they often, the prophets declare that it is of no value when they do not proceed from a devout mind. So, our devotion, our commitment is what counts, and I plan to remind us of that next Sabbath, just prior to the day of day of Pentecost, because uh, as we heard even in the opening prayer, we need to be committed and we need to remain in tough times and in good times we need to remain faithful to the eternal. Now the rejection of ritual observances is proclaimed by the two prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, who chiefly assisted in the two they, they chiefly assisted the two pious kings. One assisted Hezekiah, it was Isaiah, and the other assisted Josiah, it was Jeremiah. They assisted them in restoring the temple service. I will remind you that only Hezekiah and Josiah, as far as I can remember, no, there were other, some other righteous kings as well, but Hezekiah and Josiah were the leading righteous kings on the throne of David. Josiah indeed had a far-reaching reforms, because by that time the Jewish society was... Uh, devolved so much into idolatry and paganism and he made far-reaching reforms in order to secure that the people would never again uh, uh, wander into into uh, paganism. Uh, in fact, as a historical fact, let me give you this information as well. Uh, the, the Passover, the Old Testament Passover was a domestic observance. Each family was commanded to Slay, you know, the Passover lamb at certain time, uh, at the at the at the dusk of the thirteenth to fourteenth Abib, and each family would keep that. Now, by that time, by the time of Josiah, the Jewish society got so much corrupted and so much uh, was uh, shattered by idolatry that it was Josiah who basically centralized this custom. So instead of being a domestic custom, so that, you know, he was afraid that people being given to their own devices may just slaughter the Passover lamb in honor of Baal or Ishtar and so on, he made it a central, centralized observance so each family would come to the temple and then under the authority and supervision of the temple priesthood they would sacrifice the Passover lamb and that um, custom has continued until the times of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ was at stake, while he was dying at stake, the uh, local population was bringing, taking their lambs for slaughter on the uh, 14th to 15th, because by the time of Jesus Christ, the Jews have amalgamated the uh, the Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so it became one uh, one observance that was la that would last for eight days, and then of course. Complete, they've completely lost the, uh, the, 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 uh, the understanding that we talk about the two different events. The Passover commemorating, passing over of the death angel in the land of Egypt, passing over the houses of Israelites and sparing them from death. And the second event was the, uh, uh, was commemorating the departure of Israelites from Egypt because the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts with the uh, night to be much observed. On that night, the Israelites left Egypt. The, the Jews have blurred all those meanings and all those all, all, all those two festivals into one. And therefore, they now live, even to these days, they live in confusion. You see what they keep as the Passover night? Their seder uh, supper is actually commemoration of the Israelites leaving Egypt. Not the angel of death passing over the houses of Israelites and sparing the firstborn from death. We as Christians today, we keep the Christian Passover 
the Christian New Testament possible. We we need to be aware of those things and uh, those nuances, brethren. We, we need to keep them uh, uh, very clearly uh, differentiated in our minds. So anyway, back to these two kings. There were these two, two kings who basically uh, restored the temple services. Uh, how did they restore the temple services? Well, you might remember that David, when he was alive, he also wrote all the Psalms that were used in the temple services. That he divided, he had the, 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 the courses, the shifts of, uh, of priests who would be serving in the temple at a certain time of the year. And so uh, that's how, based on that model, uh, both Hezekiah and Josiah were able to restore the temple service. And God, brethren, rejects not the ceremonial service, but he rejects the substitution of it for personal holiness and morality. And for parallel scripture to that, you can see Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll lay stumbling blocks before my pe- before these people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them, the neighbor and his friend shall perish. So you see, spoiler will come suddenly. Verse 22, Thus says the Lord, Behold, a people comes from the north country, and a great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. They will lay hold on bow and spear. They're c- cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. And they ride on horses as men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Zion. Here it says that, you know, they're uh, cruel, that uh, they're cruel, well, rather it should say they're ruthless, they're inhuman, basically. In the Assyrian monuments, warriors put the vanquished to death. Rows of impaled victims hang around the walls of the besieged towns, and men collect in heaps, hands cuff cut from the vanquished. So, uh, this power is Assyrians. But the modern Assyrians, they are Germans. They are going to be the punishment for the modern house of Israel. Verse 24. We have heard the report of it. Our hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. Do not go out into the field nor walk by the way. Because of the sword of the enemy, fear is on every side. O daughter of my people, dress in sackcloth and roll about in ashes, make mourning as far and only as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the plunderer will suddenly come upon us. I have set you as an assayer, and a fortress among my people, that you may know and test their way. They are all stubborn rebels, walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron. They are all corruptors. You see, brethren, they are bronze and iron. They are not silver and gold, but bronze and iron. And uh, you may check a parallel scripture with that is in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 4. Verse 29, the bellows blow fiercely, the lead is consumed by the fire. The smelter refines in vain, for the wicked are not drawn off. So it's worn out by continual blowing. The prophet has exhausted all his efforts. His heart, consumed by the heat of divine inspiration, can labor no more. And verse 30, finally, people will call them rejected silver, because the Lord has rejected them. And we can compare this to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 22 and to Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 18.